Hey, Westside, Dan Sutherland here. My opportunity today to introduce the new series we're starting, as well as to introduce a new pastor. The series is called Big Character. Here's the idea. When Jesus comes into our lives and we have a real relationship with him, our character is going to change. In fact, the scripture lists nine specific ways it will change. We'll do that series this summer. And the speaker today, well, reality is he visited with us in November. He spoke for us in February and in April. But this is his first official, now on the payroll, now moved here, now stuck with us, and we're thrilled to have him. How about a hand for one of our new teaching pastors, Rob Wegner? Hey, West Side. Hey, I just want to thank you on behalf of Michelle and the girls. It's been an incredibly warm welcome. It's been a pretty hair-raising journey for us. We lived in one community for 20-something years, building one church. But when Jesus leads, you have to follow. And the yellow brick road ended up in Kansas. We're here. And, we're, and we just feel so privileged and honored to be a part of the story Jesus is writing through Westside family. And I'm really excited to be able to kick off this series. So everybody awake? Ready to go? All right, pull out your notes. We're going to look at a passage from 2 Corinthians. And it's kind of a good news, bad news passage. All right? It's good news and bad news. So let's read it together. This is 2 Corinthians 4.16. It says, Outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Outwardly we are wasting away. If you need proof, look at your neighbor. That's the bad news part. But inwardly... We are being renewed day by day. Paul here is talking about our existence as multidimensional beings. There's an outer you. You have skin and hair and, and, and a body that people can see. It's temporary. It's visible. But then there's this inner you, and it's the real you. It's your heart. It's your soul. It's your mind. It's your character. It's not quite as visible, and it's eternal. And Paul is noticing this sort of a con contrast and comparison he says, the outer me is wasting away. In other words, here's the bad news. Old man wrinkles is coming for everybody in this room. And you know what I'm talking about. The weight, it's just from the poles to the equator. <laughs> hair stops growing where it's supposed to grow and boldly grows where no hair has grown before on your body. <laughs> Start having to trim your ears and stuff like that. It's messed up. And, and what Paul is saying, I don't care what you do. You can starve it. You can exercise it. You can nip it. You can tuck it. You can Rogaine it. You can Botox it. You can dress it up with clothes from the plaza. Old man wrinkles is coming for you. And eventually this body ends up as really expensive worm food in the ground. Aren't you glad you came to hear that this morning? <laughs> That's the outer you. But then Paul says, hey, there's something else though going on inside of me since I met Jesus. While the old me is going south fast, he said, the, the inner me, it's coming alive. The inner me, there's something that's exactly the opposite. My, my body is going you know, south, but my, my heart, my inner me, it is coming alive. In other words, places where there was hatred and bitterness, now there's love bubbling up. This place where there was this angst and emptiness, there's now joy that is flourishing. Where I used to be anxious and worried and fearful, there's a peace and, a, and this confidence. It's the best thing that's going on in my life. Since I met Jesus, the inner me is being transformed. It's coming alive. And that's God's plan, not just for Paul, but for every single one of us in this room. How I many know oh, Jesus' plan wasn't for people to call themselves Christians and then remain just as prideful, selfish, greedy, lustful, arrogant, self-righteous, and egotistical, and then just die and go to heaven? Isn't that a depressing plan? That was not Jesus' plan. Jesus, the movement he started, which is doing very well, thank you very much, can I get an amen, amen. is the movement for the transformed heart. His plan is to transform us from the inside out so that we become radiantly loving people. And that's where we're going this summer. 
That's what big character is all about. It's about how do we step into this reality that Paul describes where we find ourselves coming alive and you know you're aching for it and so am I. And if you want to see what big character really looks like, let's look at Galatians chapter 5 together, verses 22 and 23. This is uh, an amazing description of big character. And we're going to read this actually out loud together. But I'm going to ask you to multitask. Because as you're reading this, there's a list of a number of things that Paul works through. I want you, as we read it out loud, to also try to keep track of how many things are in the list. All right? Now, some of you are going to pull a muscle in your cerebellum, but just give it a shot. Here we go. Let's stand to our feet. Let's wake up our bodies and wake up our hearts. This is the word of the Lord for us this morning. Galatians chapter 5, 22 and 23, nice and loud. Here we go. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And all God's people said? Amen. Now look at your neighbor and says, God wants you to be fruity. Just tell him. <laughs> he wants you to be fruity. Don't be mean. Some of you are being mean. You can sit down. Some are saying, you're already fruity, dude. <laughs> you're a fruit cake, fruit salad. <laughs> now, that's character. Right there. That list that Paul calls the fruit of the Spirit. It's about a supernaturally changed heart. And write this down. Here's the big idea for the whole series. Jesus wants to produce his character in me. My role is to abide. His role is to produce. Isn't that a relief? His role is to produce. My role is to abide. In other words, it's called the fruit of the what? It's not the fruit of Rob. It's not the fruit of Dan or the fruit of Brian or the fruit of West Side. This is something that can only be produced in us through Jesus by his spirit. It is the fruit of the spirit. And when we abide, this is what is produced in us. And today we're going to look at the fruit from two different angles. We're going to look at the, the product. In other words, what does this fruit actually look like in a human life? And then we're going to look at the process of big character. How is it produced? So let's start with the product of big character. Write this down. Big character is all about love. That's the product of the fruit of the Spirit. Big character is all about love. Now, quick quiz. I asked you to keep track of how many were in the list. We were multitasking. So what do we got? What is that? Say it out loud. Nine. 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 Someone last service said seven. I felt really bad for him. <laughs> I was like, time to go back to school, dude. You can actually use your fingers and get there. So, yes, it's It's nine. It's nine. It's plural, right? But let me bring your attention to something because there's this little twist in the passage. It's really curious. Did you notice it's called the fruit of the Spirit? Can you underline that? It's not called the fruits of the Spirit. Isn't that weird? Here's a list of nine, but it's not fruits of the Spirit. It's fruit. And, and again, circle this. It doesn't say the fruits of the Spirit are, what does it say? The fruit of the Spirit is. Underline the word is. Now the word fruit there, the Greek word is karpos, and it is singular. Now why is that? Did Paul fail grammar? What's going on? Well, let's dig into that together, and let's do that by looking at, we have some fruit over here. We've got some apples and some oranges and uh, a, a pineapple. Remember the Chiquita banana lady? Remember her? Chiquita banana, or whatever that song was. That was Pina Colada, actually. I apologize. <laughs> that was Barry Manilow. <laughs> Dude, that is messed up. Um, but I want to bring your attention in particular to the grapes. We're having fun now, aren't we? That's good. Now, the grapes are unique because they grow in clusters. And there isn't any cluster factory where they glue these together. There isn't a cluster union of workers that glue these together. They grow in a cluster. And when Paul says the fruit of the Spirit is, what he's saying is it grows in a cluster. But I want you to let your imagination be captured for a moment. 
because he's describing these wonderful dimensions, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. So imagine each one of those as a separate fruit. And imagine if there was a super fruit where each of the individual fruits would not lose their uniqueness, but they would all grow together. Imagine if all of these grew on one cluster as a super fruit. How cool would that be? And you could pick off an apple or a pear or grapes or bananas. That's the kind of image Paul is trying to paint in our mind. Imagine this super fruit where you have all these unique fruits, but they're all together in one fruit. How many of you would like to taste that? It would be the only fruit that you would ever need. And if we really want to get right down to it, if it's a singular fruit and we have to pick a word for it, I would like to argue that the, the, the word that Paul would use to describe the entire fruit of the Spirit would be the word love. Look at your neighbor and say, it's all about love, baby. It would be love. In other words, you could say it this way. The fruit is love. Love is the fruit. And the others, joy, peace, patience, kindness, they all stem from it. These different fruits, they cluster together. But the fruit is love. And the other virtues are the manifestation of that love in operation. Now, why would I think that? Because look at Paul's words. In 1 Corinthians 14, 1, he says, Follow the way of what? Love. 1 Corinthians 16, he says, Do everything in love. 1 Timothy 1.5, he says, the goal of our instruction is what? Love. Galatians 5.6, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. And then in 1 Corinthians 13, and now these three remain, faith, hope, and what? Love. But the greatest of these is love. And what did Jesus say was the greatest command? Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. God's priority for us is a four-letter word, L-O-V-E. Go for love, and you get the rest of these. And see, what we're gonna be dreaming about is how do we become radiantly loving people? Have you met a radiantly loving person? I wanna tell you about a woman you've never heard of. From the perspective of the world, she's very insignificant. Her name is Esther, but she was so significant in my life. Esther lived on the south side of Chicago. She was in her early 90s. She lived in this rundown old house in a pretty bad neighborhood. She was an old maid. She lived with another old maid named Lucille. No husband, no kids. From the world's perspective, they were most to be pitied. They had no money, no family, in a rundown house. Now, what they did have is they had one child. It was a poodle. And they loved that little poodle. And they had a little cage outside their house, and they put the little poodle in the little poodle cage, and the little poodle would go in the poodle cage and poo-poo. And, and, and there eventually there'd be enough poodle poo-poo that it would be a significant problem and someone needed to come, a, a, a poo-poo professional, and clean out the poo-poo. And guess who got that job? And it was forced la labor. My mom was like, you are gonna go over there. I'm like, ah. And the cage was about this high, so you're literally like down here with the feces. It's horrible. I bent over picking up the poodle poo-poo. I hated it. And then I get snagged into other stuff. Like I got to mow the lawn and clean out their garage. And I got to tell you, I did not want to go. In fact, when I first went in there, I remember walking into their house and went, smells like old people. <laughs> and, you know, all the decorations were like circa 1950, you know. And it just as a young man, it was like, this is the last place I want to be. But I got to tell you something. This might sound weird. A 15-year-old kid, I fell in love with Esther. Because I watched, and over the months and eventually years, she began to lose everything that I valued as a young man, her ability to see, her ability to walk. Lucille died, and then she was literally all alone. And I could think she's, she's losing everything, but she didn't get bitter, she kept getting better. She let unlovely circumstances bring forth love in her, unkind circumstances bring out kindness in her. And honestly, I'd never met anyone who was so radiantly loving. It actually sort of took my breath away. You know, when she talked about God, it wasn't like he was some abstraction. She talked about a God who loved her extravagantly and it freed her to love extravagantly. When she talked about Jesus, it was like he woke her up in the morning and then they would go, you know, have breakfast together and they would talk all day long and he would tuck her in at night. And, and I remember she, when I would come in, she'd always grab my hand and she would say, Rob, Jesus loves you 
so much. And it was like something out of her soul, like a laser gaze that just went right into my soul. And I believed it for the first time. And you know, all the things I valued, being able to run and independent and do what I want to do, she couldn't do all those things. And she'd say, but you know what I can do, Rob? I can pray. And I spent all day with Jesus and we talked together and she would say, and I'm praying for you. And I knew she was praying. You know, sometimes you go somewhere and there's just, like you stand in front of the Rocky Mountains and there's this sense of awe and wonder and just God. You know, the palpable presence of God. You know what I'm talking about? Here's this rundown, dilapidated house with a little old woman that smells like old people. You would walk in there and it was like, God is here. I mean, you could feel the presence of God in that woman's house. And I remember one time, Michelle and I were over there, and she said, I've been praying for you guys, and God showed me some of the things he's going to do. It's going to be amazing. And we're like, really, what is it? And she's like, he told me I can't tell you. <laughs> and, there's a lot, she said, and there's a lot of times where I look back on the things Michelle and I have experienced over the last 30 years since then, and I wonder how many of them are traced back directly to the prayers of this little old woman who shook heaven and earth. The greatest people on the planet aren't the people who necessarily walk with presidents and prime ministers. The most powerful people on the planet are people who walk with God in prayer. And that's who Esther was. And when Esther finally passed away, she made, made sure Michelle and I got her fine china. But the most powerful imprint had, had nothing to do with china. It was her life on our life of this woman who was so radiantly loving And see, that's what we have to decide, what matters most to us. What are, we, what are we actually pursuing? You know, 1 Corinthians 13, you probably all heard it read at a wedding. Love is patient, love is kind, that whole passage. But right before that, in 1 Corinthians 12, you know what he says about love? Look at these words. He says this, now I will show you the most excellent way. And there are a lot of debates about what the most excellent way is. And Paul says, it is love. And I want to ask you, honestly, between you and God, are you living a life surrendered to that ultimate goal? God, make me a more loving person. Make me radiantly loving from the core. And that's what we're going to dream about the next eight weeks. Let's dream together about Westside becoming the most radiantly loving community of people on the planet. Are you in? That's a dream worth letting God capture our hearts with. And that's the product. That's what God wants to produce in us. So let's look at the process. How in the world is that shaped in us? Because if you're self-aware at all, you're realizing, hmm, I got a long ways to go. I sure do. So write this down. Here's the process. Big character is not primarily about striving, but yielding. Big character is now primarily about striving, but yielding. Now notice again, Paul doesn't say the traits of the Spirit, the component parts of the Spirit, the aspects of the Spirit, the gears of the Spirit. He says it's the fruit of the Spirit. The metaphor is organic. And you might want to write this down because there's a, a comparison of worldviews, I think, that is implicit. And it's organic. And see, in the scripture, the guiding metaphors are almost all organic. And I challenge you to study and look for yourself. It's, it's fruit, and it's body, and it's seeds, and it's yeast. But we live in a time currently where I would argue the guiding metaphors are primarily mechanical. So what's the significance of that? Well, here we live on this side of the Industrial Revolution, and we're used to manufacturing things. We make things, and that sort of manufacturing mechanical worldview dominates how we think about change. Because in a mechanical worldview, you have to manufacture and make things, right? So think about our language. We say things like this all the time. I got to make this happen, right? Or we need to make friends. Or I need to make time. Think about that phrase. I need to make time. How many of us said that this week? And see, what that reveals is something very deep inside of us, an operating, guiding metaphor. Think about the phrase, I have to make time. Seriously? You know how to make time? That's amazing. Here, I thought there were only 24 hours in a day, and you know how to make minutes? 
Man, you gotta get some investors in on that. That's huge. Here, I thought God made time and we simply steward it. And say, I gotta make this happen. What does that reveal? That deep down inside of me, I think I have to get the gears moving, click everything together. I've got to build this. I've gotta manage it. I've gotta manufacture. I've gotta make it happen. And there are some things we were never meant to manufacture or make. And, it, it's, and it's sort of the predominant worldview. And I know it's easy to go, oh, come on, it's just semantics. Really? Because Jesus said the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Your language reveals what your operating worldview is. And see, the Bible invites us into this organic worldview. And see, here's the difference. Organic is about yielding, and we're going to unpack this a little bit more. And what mechanical is about is striving. You know, if you have to have an image in your head... Think about this as a seed and then a flower blooming, and this is like gears, and we've got to get the gears clicking and moving and operating. And we're going to compare two different postures of our heart. Mechanical, I'm going to summarize it as S and S, all right? And organic, I'm going to summarize it as R and R. So let's get into S and S first. It sounds like something really naughty, but it's not. You can write this down. Striving is about two things, squeeze and snap back. Squeeze and snap back. Brian made reference earlier to this Nerf ball, right? And what's cool about a Nerf ball, and, and he, he was kind of joking around, but honestly, it's a new day around here. If you're sleeping during service, we will take you out now. <laughs> we are armed and dangerous. And I played a lot of baseball and football, so I can get you way back up there. In the dark up there, I see you. All right? Now, what's cool about a Nerf ball is uh, you can apply pressure to it, Right? And you can restrain its character for a while. And as long as you keep the pressure, you squeeze, you can restrain the character. But eventually, if you let the pressure off, squeeze, what does it do? Snap back, right? So it's squeeze, put the pressure on, snap back. Squeeze, snap back. All right, how many of you said, I'm going to lose some weight. Squeeze, and then snap back. (laughs) You know what I'm talking about? (laughs) But it's, it's... especially in terms of our character, right? I'm going to be more patient. Squeeze all those kids. Snap back. All right? Oh, I want to be more pure. I really need to keep my focus. Squeeze. Snap back. Standard operating procedure is squeeze. Snap back. We think, okay, I'm, if I just muscle up, i got to make it happen. I'm going to pressure. I'm going to use my willpower. I'm going to focus on it. And we squeeze. But what happens? Snap back. And you know what this is? You can, you can write this down because this is in your notes. This is very important. All you get from striving is a morally restrained heart. Not a supernaturally transformed heart. And see, the difference between a morally restrained heart and a supernaturally transformed heart See, they can kind of look the same on the outside, actually. Someone who's striving to be patient can on the, externally kind of have the same appearance as a person who is actually being transformed by the Spirit to be patient. But you know what the difference is in terms of your experience? It's the difference between eating wax fruit and real, fresh, organic fruit. And that's why there's a lot of Christians who, like, they look like good people, but inside they're actually really miserable because they've never actually shifted that, yes, we are saved by grace, we know that, but guess what? You're transformed by grace too. And here's the problem. As we start this series, there's two potential problems. One is that some of us are really good at the squeeze. And over the next eight weeks, we're gonna be like, I'm gonna work on this. And it's gonna look pretty good. Hey, check this out. I got it. You know what, you know what grows in us? It's called Pride. It's called self-righteousness. Look, I did it. I'm doing it. And the last thing Kansas City needs is another self-righteous, prideful church. Amen? The other potential problem is this. We go through these eight weeks, and some of us aren't that great with the squeeze and the moral restraint. So it'll be like, all right, I'm going to work on love this week. Oh, oh, snap back. I'm going to work on joy this week. Oh, snap back. By the time we get to week three, it's going to be like, dude, I'm done. I don't even think I'm going. And you know what it can lead to then is this paralysis of just condemnation and guilt. Like, oh, man. And you know, after a prideful church, the next last thing Kansas City needs is a paralyzed church. 
a church paralyzed by condemnation. So here's the problem. Write this down. What striving leads to is more self-centeredness. It's the seed of self-centeredness. And we need a new seed. And that seed is described here in 1 Peter 1.23. For you've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. It is a gift of the Spirit. And the good news is striving, squeeze and snap back, is not the only option. Here's the other one, yielding, write it down. And this is what yielding looks like. Remain and respond. Remain and respond. Let's talk about remaining first. Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain, underline that, if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So when Jesus says, remain with me, it's a relational invitation to spend all day, every day with Jesus. He's saying, do life with me. Yes, spend time alone with me, but learn how to spend an ordinary day with me. Get to know me. Let's do life together. Remain in me. And there's a way of doing life with God. And he says, if you remain in me, and, I, and I'm going to remain in you, don't worry about it. Count on that. The question is, will you remain in me? You will bear much fruit. Because here's what happens. When you remain with Jesus by his spirit, he begins to speak to you. And he'll begin to pinpoint things on your heart that he wants to transform by the power of his spirit. And then you have the opportunity to respond. Now, if you're not remaining in relationship with Jesus, you're, you're going to have so much static and noise, you're not going to probably effectively be able to hear the voice of the spirit who's trying to pinpoint how he wants to transform you. But you remain in Jesus and you respond by the Spirit. And that's described also in Galatians chapter 5, in the verses preceding and following the description of the fruit of the Spirit. Look at what it says. You may remember this from a couple months back. So I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step. So what's responding in the Spirit? It's walk by and keep in step. Remember? Walk by. And keep in step. And if we remain with Jesus and we walk by and keep in step, the Spirit will begin to show things that He wants to change, and then we respond. And let me give you just a little picture of what this looks like. Because I I, I tell you what, um, I'm not trying to say yielding is easy. Now it's a given. You don't go out to an orchard and see trees going, we're gonna make some fruit. <laughs> or branches ripped off running around, we gotta make some fruit, we gotta make some fruit, you know. The, the, the branches remain, right? And what do they do? They respond to the sun and the rain and the nutrients in the soil, right? They respond to the pruning of the gardener. That's the image. It's the posture of our heart. Now, I'm not saying it's easy because remaining and responding is a whole new way of life. But let me give you a little picture of what it looks like. Last Friday, Michelle and I, my wife, we went on a date. We went to Shawnee Mission Park, which is just a botanical paradise, just beautiful. And we're there right at the golden hour where the sun is setting, and we went up to the top of that tower that's maybe 40 or 50 tall, feet tall that, like, if a couple of strong guys pushed on it, I think would actually just go over. <laughs> and I took a picture of my wife from up there. Isn't that stunning? I mean, I looked at Kansas, and I thought, Kansas, you're beautiful. And then my next thought was, but you got nothing on my wife. <laughs> she is awesome. And literally, that's one of my all-time favorite pictures of Michelle. Just look at her smile. And so we got down from the tower, and I was kind of, I just, I'm looking at this picture, and I'm like, this is amazing. So I, I sent it to some of my buddies via text. I'm like, check out my wife. My wife is so hot. She's awesome. Look at Kansas City. It's, look at, it's so pretty. And I sent it out to them, and then we drove over to get dessert. And while we're sitting having dessert, my buddies, my, my phone starts blowing up. They're all like writing back, like, wow, dude, that's, that's an awesome picture. I'm like, I know, isn't my wife hot? This is awesome, you know? I'm so excited. My phone's blowing up and I'm texting like crazy and I'm on this date with Michelle and I'm texting my guys and Michelle's over here and I'm texting them about her. You know, my wife is so awesome. She's actually over here, but I'm not talking to her because I'm texting you right now. And, you know. <laughs> and seriously, about five minutes into it, she like looked at me and smiled. She said, is there anyone else you'd like to text right now? <laughs> and I was like, oh, oh, babe, I'm so sorry. So I put my phone down and we started talking and three or four minutes later, a notification came up. And have you seen that dog and up? Squirrel! <laughs> yes, capital S for stupid. I picked up the phone and started to respond to the notification. <laughs> and Michelle just looked at me and smiled again. She said, I'll be waiting in the Jeep. <laughs> and uh, I got to tell you, my first response was, I was actually kind of offended. Because I'm like, you know what? I'm texting my buddies about how awesome you are. 
And then you're all upset with me because I'm texting them about how awesome you are. Come on, I should get points for this. How many guys are texting their buddies about their wife? I'm pretty awesome, actually, you know. I could get back to the Jeep. It was kind of a quiet ride home. <laughs> it's kind of a quiet night at home, <laughs> rest of the night. I get up the next morning, and, and it's, uh, I was spending some time with Jesus because I do want to remain. I want to do life with him. And it was actually a really amazing time because sometimes, you know, you spend time with Jesus, and, and every time you're with them, there's something that happens. Sometimes you feel it. Sometimes you don't. It was one of those mornings where I just felt it. It was like God just pouring into me. And we got done at the end, and again, it wasn't an audible voice, but it was just so clear. It was like Jesus looked at me and said, hey, did you notice I didn't send one text during our time together? <laughs> In our time alone, you had all of my attention without any interruptions. So can you love your wife the way I love you? You had a date. You had a time alone. And I was like, oh, yeah. And see, that's for and respond. And when she got up, I... I got on my knees down by the couch, and I said, I'm so sorry, honey. She said, thank you. It did. It hurt. I just wanted us to be together without interruptions. And I said, you were right, and I was wrong. And you could just feel it. It wasn't like gears were making things work. It was like a flower opening, opening in my heart and her heart. And it was the Spirit of God bringing us together, and that's what he wants for you. And you know, you know where it starts? Do you know what you're ultimately yielding to? The love of Jesus for you. It was the way Jesus loved me that then empowered me to love my wife the same way. Do you see that? It was because I was remaining in him and his love that I realized I, through him I can love like this too. And listen to the words from 1 John 4. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. What does it say next? Not that we love God. In other words, not that we tried really hard to be loving people. No, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. That is love. Not that we loved God, but that God loved us. And our mission is to love Jesus, become like Jesus, share Jesus. But you know what precedes all of that is letting Jesus love you. And I want to ask you to find a quiet place this week. Go for a short walk. Not once, but I want to ask you every day. Find a place, a place to remain. And here's one prayer I want to ask you to pray this week. I put it in your notes. You can see it there. Jesus, help me to let you love me. And then let that become in me a love for you and others. Jesus, help me to let you love me. And then let that become in me love for you and others. Let's yield. Let's remain and respond. And let's start right now. I want to ask you to bow your heads with me. Jesus, please show us. Reveal to us again your great and awesome love. We look to the cross and it's unquestionable that you became a man and that you suffered and died, that you who is God, very God, took on the nature of a servant to wash our feet when we were so unlovely, when our fists were shaking in the air against you, in our pride and in our rebellion, you've loved us. And Lord, would you melt in us everything that wants to earn that love or strive for that love or to get you to owe us something. <laughs> And help us to let you love us. It's a, it's a mysterious and wonderful and supernatural thing. And we ask for it, Lord, in spades. And then, Lord, as we receive it, like a flower uh, opening in the sun and, and in the rain, let us open with love, Lord, for you and for others and even ourselves. So, Lord God, Help me to let you love me. Let that become in me a love for you and others. Jesus, help us to let you love us and let that become in us a love for you and others. And we ask for this in the strong name of Jesus Christ. Amen.